Welcome to Zoom Sunday Speak the Truth. My name is Gary Johnson. I'm your facilitator for today. Let me introduce the 2020 NABJ Pioneer Award winner, sports talk show icon and DC native, Mr. Harold Bell. Thank you, Gary. Well, I am Harold Bell and this is Speak the Truth. So this must be Sunday. I want to thank you for joining everybody out there that's joining us and uh, my team for this segment on women's history. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, my team. Of course, uh, Gary Johnson is the facilitator. Uh, Gary is uh, the CEO and founder of blackmeninamerica.com, uh, which is one of the top 10 black websites uh, in, in the community. Uh, Gary has done a fantastic job in, in joining Gary uh, on this team as his son, uh, Chris Johnson, a.k.a. CJ. CJ is our political commentator in all things sports, and he is a contributing writer for BlackMenInAmerica.com. Our oh, new kid on the block uh, who has joined us is my man, Jacques Chavez, Chav if I could get his right name right. <laughs> it sounds like he's from France, <laughs> but he's from the ghetto. <laughs> Jacques, Jacques has been um, a, a great guy. I mean, he's a native Washingtonian. Uh, he's, a, he's a business, he's an entrepreneur, a businessman, uh, all things sports, and uh, he's going to be joining us on the show today. So I would like to uh, welcome Jacques. And, of course, I got to move over to uh, my friend and long time, uh, and it's none other than Jackie Jones. Jackie is a former uh, columnist, writer uh, for the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, the New York Post. Uh, she is, uh, is now currently the Assistant Dean of Communications at Morgan State University. And of course, welcome Jackie. And joining us is a longtime friend, pioneer, when it comes to uh, broadcast media, uh, she was uh, out of Kansas, out of Kansas City, really Kansas, University of Kansas. She was the first black female sportscaster uh, in the state. And she came to Washington, D.C. and became the first uh, black female sportscaster on WTTG uh, Television 5. She's a former host of the Maggie Lenton Show uh, what, that was heard on Sirius XM Radio. And uh, like I said, she has performed on stage and screen, and I'm talking about none other than Miss Maggie Lynn. And also joining me is uh, the lady you see on my left, <laughs> my wife of 52 years, and uh, she is uh, a civil rights icon uh, back in the early 50s. Uh, he was with her dad in South Carolina, and he was the president of the NAACP. Uh, he was a professor on the on the University of South, South Carolina State University, where he started the registration drive. He started registration drive that went all over the state on the campus of uh, South Carolina State. Uh, he marched with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and uh, he also was hooked up in networking with a, a great, great man that we just lost. Uh, I didn't realize how great he was until really I took time out. He was right here in Washington, D.C. almost his whole career. And Vernon Jordan, I'm talking about. I'd like to uh, welcome my wife, uh, Patty T. Bell. Also, I'd like to start out uh, with, uh, with Maggie. Maggie, tell me who are some of the heroes in, in women's history that, that you want to talk about? Who is somebody that in particular that you want to talk about today? Well, you know, when I heard you talking about um, Hattie talking about her mother, I have to talk about my mom and uh, and also my sister. They they were. Uh, but my mom in particular uh, was born and raised in the in the Deep South. She was born in a place that many of you have probably never heard of called Hollywood, Mississippi, which is right over the railroad tracks from Memphis. And she was actually raised in Memphis, but born in Hollywood, Mississippi. And um, she left home at 16 years old. Her name was Evelyn. Davis at that point. Uh, actually, it was really Evelina Ernestine, so she changed her name but to <laughs> Evelyn. Uh, but um, she, at 16 years old, she basically was sold out. 
you know, and you don't, we don't think of it that way. But when our parents tell us you're going someplace else to live, it's not a foster home, you'll be taking care of somebody. I'm sorry. And you're being paid for it. In a sense, it's a slave, but it's the best thing that could have happened to her. Because um, my mom got in with uh, eventually two different colonels. And back then they were called governesses. Now they're called nannies who had principles and were people who believed in the arts and training and things like that. And my mom went ahead and, and like a sponge and did everything she could in 1944. She uh, went to beauty school and um, became, you know, her own shop owner. And her shop was in our home after um, my dad was out a lot at that point because he was in the service. But, you know, the things she accomplished just within the community within her church, uh, was very well read. And she always used to, she raised my sister and I always saying, you can't be using black and a woman as an excuse for why you didn't accomplish. She said, you use that and hold it up as a reason for why you did accomplish something. You know, no half-stepping, no, you know, constantly um, telling us we don't say dims and does, we don't say dis and dats. You speak so people will understand what you're saying. And in the long run, it really helped me become the person that I am and how I speak. And I remember kids years ago used to say, oh, you talk like white people. No, I talk like my mom and dad taught me how to speak. And both of them, my mom did not graduate from high school until in the 70s, okay? And uh, so uh, she was well up there but she never believed in not accomplishing something. And that was the, you know, I think one of the greatest joys I had in my life was um, when I did sports in St. Louis for two years because of cable, my mom and dad were able to see me in Kansas every night. My mom would call me almost every single night and critique me. <laughs> but, um, you know, when during the summertime, we would, uh, our vacations were wherever the NAACP convention was. And you say, oh, I don't know about that, but it was such a learning experience, but we didn't sit there through all the meetings as my dad was sitting in many of the, you know, conference type meetings where they were making judgments about things. Um, my mom was taking us to the arts and to museums and we'd go to ballets in whatever city it was. Uh, she made us curious about the world and for that, I credit her. Um, and it's made me that much more curious and special in the world. And, uh, you know, they, she and my sister were at the uh, original March on Washington. My mom felt it was important for her to be there. My dad was working. I unfortunately stayed home, but, <laughs> uh, but those are the kinds of things she did. And she traveled and constantly read and learned and taught me how to do the same thing. So that my homage is to her. And because of her, I and my dad, I credit where I am today. All right. Okay, uh, we are talking about women's uh, history. This is Women's History Month. So we're talking about uh, your favorite story, whether it be a relative or someone that you encountered along your way in the game called life. I would like to move up uh, to Jackie Jones. Jackie? Well, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, women journalists. Um, I, you know, the, the first person that comes to mind is Ida B. Wells, uh, who was a trailblazing journalist and after whom many uh, uh, young women journalists today kind of model their careers. Uh, there's even an Ida B. Wells uh, uh, Society for Investigative Reporting, uh, okay. which is uh, uh, led by and was founded by uh, Nicole Hannah um, Jones, who it was the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, a journalist from the New York Times who created the 1619 Project uh, that everybody read and is now being used in schools all over the country. Um, I think of, of uh, people like uh, April Ryan from the American Urban uh, Radio Network and who's also a commentator for CNN. Um, she's put up with a lot you know, coming into uh, uh, covering politics, especially in the White House. Um, I think of her, I think of uh, Yamiche Alcindor uh, uh, at PBS and, and Abby Phillip at CNN, who put up with an incredible amount of abuse from Donald Trump during his administration. And despite his behavior, they demonstrated class and uh, preparedness 
and focus and, and discipline in a time when they could have, when things could have really gotten even uglier than they were. Um, and I think that they are great role models for, for young uh, journalists everywhere. Um, and I also noted just noticed just before uh, we got started that today is Simone Biles' birthday, and you know having started my career in sports, um, I was uh, uh, pleased to see she turned 24 today. She is the third most decorated athlete in the world, uh, behind uh, Vitaly Sherbo of Belarus and uh, uh, Larissa Lat Latinina from Russia. She has 30. Uh, combined medals, uh, Olympic and, and world championship medals. And I also want to salute Renee Hess, who has uh, founded uh, the Black Girls Hockey Club. And it started because she was taking her kid to hockey games and practices. And she said she looked around and realized that she probably wasn't the only Black woman who um, had an interest in hockey. And so she reached out on social media and has now created an organization that is recognized statewide, I mean, uh, nationwide. And uh, the National Hockey League has begun inviting the chapters of the Black Girls Hockey Club to events uh, at their um, uh, arenas and, and trying to create outreach programs in, in uh, communities of color because of her work. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, for those who just joined us, I see we have a couple, I see uh, Hattie's sister has joined us, uh, Charlize. Uh, uh, Stevenson in Savannah, Georgia, and I see that we have Kevin King uh, who has joined us. We're talking about Women's Month history. We're talking about the history of women. And uh, I want to, Jackie and Maggie just made their presentation. I want to move to a man. I want to move to Gary uh, and, and see who Gary likes to honor on Women's uh, Month history. Gary? Uh, I would honor my mother. Ernestine Johnson, who was uh, one of the first female officers in the Metropolitan Police Department. <clears throat> well, I remember as a kid growing up, it was a bunch of ladies and they would always call, they were going to work at the Women's Bureau. And then they studied at night and then they slowly became police officers. And my mother was one of the first ones that made the rank of Sergeant, started the uh, officer friendly program were having officers go out to the schools. She retired from the MPD and then decided that she wanted to go back to school and she got a law degree. She got picked up uh, and started working for the Senate Select Committee, uh, Senate Select Committee Intelligence on the assassination of Martin Luther King and JFK. She was the only black female investigator there and um, so she's been the one that has been a really good role model for us as a police officer who retired from the force. And then, you know, little did I know the influence that she had on me because I ended up being a federal agent for about seven years. Um, I ended up going to the same law school that she went, except I didn't graduate, uh, <laughs> but I was there. <laughs> but yeah, very big influence, uh, Ernestine Johnson, my mom. All right. Um, I'd like to uh, move to my left here. And I, I introduced uh, my wife, Hattie, and, and talking about the influence in her life was, uh, of course, her father, Dr. Charles H. Thomas, uh, who was president of the NAACP in Owensburg, South Carolina, also taught at uh, South Carolina State University. Uh, marched with Dr. Martin Luther King, and uh, the whole family was on the picket lines. But the uh, you say that behind every great man, there's a greater woman. Uh, Hattie, how about uh, introducing your mother? Oh, my mother was uh, the greatest. She was strong. The strength she had behind my uh, my father with all of her children. They were, we, we all uh, six, but she was like, uh, almost like a single mother when daddy was doing all of the work uh, with the civil, in the civil rights movement and before. Mama was right there to uh, hold, really just hold us together and do all the necessary things that we, 
that was needed to be done in the home as well as go out and uh, do what she could uh, out among the uh, all of the uh, work we had to do in the community. And I remember when she, uh, when daddy went to get his document, he, uh, she had to stay home with all her children. And I remember her, especially when we were little girls, three little girls, she would braid our hair every day and then go to, to the end of the road, end of the street. Well, it was a road really, where she was. And she, I can remember her braiding our hair, running through the road, coming behind the girls at school, to a college. Lean back over, Hattie. Yeah, yeah. there I'm we sorry. go. Yeah, she, um, she went to, my point is, she went to school and finished college and grad school after she was married and had three of us, or three or four, was it Charlie's Dr. Stevenson? My yeah. sister just joined. Hey, uh, Dr. Stevenson, uh, Charlie's uh, had his sister. Why don't you join and pick it up uh, from there, Charlie? Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the privilege to speak and follow Hattie. Um, I voice her sentiments with our mothers, not only mothers, grandmothers, aunts, our sisters, our, the teachers in our family. And um, mother, she's correct. Mother went back to school when we were first, second, third grade. And um, we lived about 10 miles from South Carolina State in Claflin. And she was catching a ride and daddy would take us every afternoon to pick her up. So it was a challenge and we had chores to do as all of you listening, so I won't belabor that. But I thought, and I tell that to students and my church member students that I work with in higher ed, that you, you have to have some backbone. And it's ladies, not that we are offending the men in any way, but it's the ladies who have been strong enough to endure so much. Um, and as we look at uh, Stacey Abrams and those that are following, um, a lot of people led the path for that. And when I say um, the influence in the civil rights movement, it was very meaningful to us. And to come up in that atmosphere and to still be out here trying to fight and, and do the kinds of things. When I look at my sisters, all four of us in different cities of Maryland, uh, Columbia, Savannah, uh, North Carolina, all of us went on, got master's degrees, and that's not a bragging. It's just saying how strong women are, and I support at 80, I've turned 80, and I'm looking at those coming behind me, and I stand ready to help them to stand when we're out of the way, and, and we thank the men for allowing us and being with us uh, as we raised the children, cooked the meals, did so much that and empowered us. And I, I just say God speed to everybody else that's had similar pro, um, situations. Thank right, you, thank Harold. You. Uh -huh, thank you, Charlie. Jacques, come on in, Jacques, and tell us about uh, your experience uh, uh, during this month that we're celebrating women. <clears throat> well, uh, my story, uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, a lot of occurrence with uh, an ancestors with education, but I will say this. I had a grandmother in Bowie, uh, excuse me, Vista, Maryland. Her name was Mayflower, is what we all called her. She raised nine children in a shack with no running water, no electricity up until her death in 64, I think it was, and or 65. And all my mother's sisters and brothers went to Fairmont Heights High School. The only time they saw running water or electricity was when they got to school. But my grandmother was very petite woman, Mayflower, as we called her. And she was very stern. She raised nine children. Uh, she was a, a, a hardworking a homemaker. Uh, her husband uh, was part owner of the old Vista Raceway here in PG County. And uh, 
my mother, when she started working, she married my father. He was 34 and she was 18. I tell the story that my father was right, waiting around the corner at Felmer Heights High School graduation. <laughs> and when my mother graduated, he married. You know what I'm saying, Hattie? <laughs> and so, you know, he, he, he one of them Louisiana French Creole boys, you know. And uh, so my mother ended up getting a job later and she would walk sometimes from Kitland right near the old Jimmy's Crab House to PG hospitals. She worked in the dietary department and we didn't have a lot of food at times. My father, unfortunately, was an alcoholic and she would give us food out the side door of a PG hospital. You know, of course you can't do that now because it's got cameras and everything. <laughs> but I learned the lessons of hard work. I learned how to be humble. Uh, I learned that you have to have an education. You've got to work hard. You have to be true. And my grandmother, you know, uh, she was very stern. She wasn't scared of any of her children. And she was a petite woman. And, you know, nowadays, a lot of times, uh, you know, women are scared of their children uh, and, and what have you. But as our Charlize, am I pronouncing it correctly, was saying, yes. that, you know, women are the backbone. And Charlize, I got to say this, and I, I, wanted, and I hope you take this in the right way. If I wasn't married, I'd be asking for your phone number one. <laughs> for 80. Thank, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is, Charlie. See, that's exactly, you know, I've been with my wife 42 years. So I got 10 years behind to catch up with uh, her and his wife, Hattie. And I had an aunt named Hattie, by the way. Her real name was Elizabeth. I always thought her name was Hattie until I went to the funeral. And I said, they didn't misspell her name. And they said, no, oh, Hattie was a nick. I never knew that. <laughs> well, I lived to be like 92 years of age, I think. But anyway, wow. so that's my tribute to Black women, who I've always adored. All right. Kevin, Kevin King, why don't you come in, Kevin? We'll save Christmas for last since he's the youngest. Kevin, are you there? Cousin, by the way. Uh -huh. Yeah, I done. Yeah. I mean, Kevin's my cousin, my first oh, cousin. Okay, first all right. Okay. Kevin, you yeah, got a story? Just, uh -huh. Yeah, it's not, you know, it, it's just short and brief. I just, um, I really appreciate my wife. You know, she uh, she was raised by a single woman, which was her mother. And uh, she worked her way through school by herself. She went to Howard University. She went to Howard University Dental School. Uh, she got her uh, dental license. She went back to school. Uh, uh, and end up getting her uh, master's degree in business management. And uh, she just gave me a baby boy nine months ago. Wow. So, Please and she's done all of that stuff without any support, really, uh, from any family. Uh, yeah. she, you know, she has a, a ton of, um, uh, uh, you know, bills as far as her, her uh, you know, the college load, um, you know, and the grants and stuff. She opened her own practice. She took out almost a seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar loan from Bank of America to open up her practice as a uh, uh, as a dentist. She has an off. She she did it just before the market crash in uh, two thousand eight, and uh, she was able to open up her practice. She's right there in Silver Spring Road in Colesville Road, and uh, and then we come with the uh, COVID nineteen, and again uh, she's going through another trial or we are with the, uh, you know, she can't open up her practice the way she wants to. She's got to have limited people in there. So, but it, all in all, she's been strong through it. And she was, and you got to imagine, she was, when we had my son, it was during the COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's just a very, very strong woman. And I'm, I'm blessed uh, uh, to have her as my wife. And that's okay. it. Thank you, yep. Kevin. All right, Christopher, we're coming to you now. I know you're a young one. Well, tell us about your experience as far as uh, uh, women's history is concerned. Well, this week I was back home and I got to spend a lot of time with my 89 year old grandma and uh, to see the stories and the history that she had come come up through, um, having grown up and being being a police officer, having pictures of her with white police chiefs at a time where civil rights was brand spanking new. And um, I've uh, had a, just a chance to see the legacy and how black women build the foundation of the, the family units that we have coming up um, today and how it's still so important to, to have those strong leaders like my grandma and even like my mother who was a pioneer at the CIA, um, of the intelligence agency of um, just pioneers breaking down doors. So 
there's just so many great black women that deserve respect and to be highlighted that don't get their due on a, on a regular basis. And we need to still correct that and do that, not just during, you know, Women's History Month or Black History Month, but every day, 365. Right. Well, let me uh, kind of close this segment out right here and talk about, you know, my mother and my grandmother. I've always said that my heroes were not Black athletes. <laughs> My heroes were my grandmother and my mother. You know, they they taught us how to be strong black men. They really did. Uh, my mother, I'm, I, I really, I, my mother chased my father to New York six months pregnant. <laughs> chased him to New York. He was a playboy, so you go chase her, <laughs> chase him to New York, and I ended up being born in Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, New York which I know nothing about. You know, I'm a native Washingtonian. There's no doubt about that. But my mom stayed up there two years, and then she came back <clears throat> to D.C. Uh, she's a you know, graduated from high school. All her family on that side were educators. They were teachers, you know, and she was very bright. And the only thing she could find when she got back to Washington was a one-room shack on Douglas Street Northeast by the Lily Palms. And uh, she took me down there and... We lived there for about a year. And one morning, a uh, cold, cold morning, she got up, was gonna sneak out and go to the corner store and uh, get some milk and bread and left me with a dog, my dog by the name of Billy and a kerosene lamp. Well, she turned from the store, there were fire engines all over the place. Uh, the shack had burned down and there I was sitting in the yard with my dog, Billy, standing over me. And I mean, she became, you know, uh, she, was, she was distraught. And she thanked the, uh, you know, the, the fire department men uh, for saving me. And they said, no, we didn't save me. He was sitting right here with the dog <laughs> when we got here. So evidently the dog led me out. My dog really led me out. And since he wasn't talking, I don't know how I got out there today. <laughs> so, and then of course I went on to live with my, my grandmother. She took me up to my grandmother where my older brother Bobby was already back to my father was a playboy. He was gone, he was nowhere. But my grandmother was a strong black lady, man. She, I mean, she raised us and I, I owe her and my mom for the man that I turned out to be today. I uh, mean, my great grandfather laid the first brick to build, to build Mount Mary Baptist Church in North Calpton, Elstreet in 1893. So I come out of a church background my grandmother had us in church three or four times a week and all day Sunday, all day Sunday, man, we were in church. So when I got away with my grandmother, I, I said, oh, that's enough church. <laughs> but she laid the foundation, you know, I mean, we learned how to be men, young men. And we had to see Mount Airy Baptist Church was like um, on Sunday, it was packed. You didn't get there by 11 o'clock, you had to stand up. And us little kids, we had to get out of those seats that we had when other uh, you know, people came into the church. And so it was just a great foundation that, that, that she laid and, and my mother laid, man. You know, I think about my mother. I want to go out here with this, but she ended up getting a house in a uh, housing project in Parkside in around 1945. I must have been about eight, nine years old when she came and got me from my, from my grandmother. And man, we did not want to leave our grandmother, man. Me and Earl, my brother, who ended up being a cop, we cried and hollered and screamed. We did not want to leave Grandma Bell. And Grandma Bell said, shut up. Y'all shut up. Y'all can walk up here anytime you want to. <laughs> so my mother <laughs> ended up taking us to this housing project in Parkside, where I grew up and where I learned to become a man. We kind of took advantage of my mother because, uh, you know, we left a strict grandma, you know, and my mother was wasn't that strict on us, so we kind of ran wild, but but she helped us, really did, to uh, to become uh, the men that we came. My brother Earl ended up being a cop, you know, a sergeant with the Mid Palm Police Department. My older brother Bobby went on to become a U.S. Marshal for 20 years, and my younger brother uh, Billy, uh, which was the, really the wild one, he went on to be when in the service, came out to be a photographer for Don King. So we owed it at all to black women, man. I'm, I'm listening to you guys and your stories, man. We were, we are really blessed. And the thing I want to throw out now, will somebody explain to me, how did a white woman become a minority? How did she become a minority? How did a white woman become a minority? 
I, I still cannot figure that out. What I figured out is what, whenever we were taking a step forward, they would find some way to make us take a step backwards. And they did that by allowing a white woman to become a minority. This is a woman that slept with the man every night and woke up with him every morning. So how can she be a minority? Can somebody explain that to me? I don't care. Jackie. Take a stab at it. You know, um, uh, I was at a, a, a event where uh, Nikki Giovanni was, a, was mm -hmm. the speaker once. And she talked about feeling sorry for white women because if ever anyone acted against their own self-interest, it was white women because of the way they had been treated by their men and that they continued to live with them and sleep with them and have their children. And so she thought um, people would, would say, you know, they feel sorry for black people in the struggle they had. And she said, but nothing it can be worse than uh, continuing to stay in a situation when it's working against your own interests. And so I think there, there's some beginning of that. And the reason that they were classified in the late 20th century as minorities was because uh, of their treatment and vis-a-vis white men. We, we look at you know, how much money we make in comparison to white men, right? What you make so many cents on the, uh, on the dollar. White women made less money. And so that then began, you know, the, the discrimination against women being able to hold office, to hold on to jobs, all of that historically uh, uh, began to qualify them as being treated like a minority, ergo, you are a minority. And I think that's, that's where the, the history of that came from, you know, through women's suffrage, did the right to get the vote, uh, being let go from women of all colors were let go of jobs after, after the wars. When their husbands came back home, those jobs were really reserved for men. The women worked them while the men were gone. And when the men came home from the war, the veterans got the jobs. And so there are all these stages throughout history where women ended up taking a back seat to men. And so and when the government, and I'm sure there was some, some politicking and behind the scenes, uh, uh, you know, lobbying and leveraging that led to women being classified as, as um, minorities. I know during women's suffrage, uh, we worked on a project this past year um, at, at Morgan. Um, there had been this somewhat unified uh, a push between black and white women to get women to vote until they realized that black men who had been uh, denied the right to vote even though they had uh, the 15th amendment that should have given them the right to vote sooner was going to be uh, uh, enforced at the same time that women were about to get the vote. And it caused a schism and white women began lobbying white men saying, well, now if you're gonna get somebody to vote, it ought to be us because we live with you. We're partners with you. We're with you all the way. And they were angry and they began to just spew all kinds of, of uh, racist venom at black women and against black men because they didn't want black men to have the vote in, in any real, genuine way, significant way before they did. And it all came home to roost <laughs> during the women's suffrage movement. And I think that's the history of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? Come on, Maggie, speak up. What y'all said sound? <laughs> Well, I, everything Jackie just said, I totally agree with, you know, how they became the, the minority is mainly because they were women. And when it started out, they, black or white, did not have a vote. They didn't own offices. I can still remember, because I'm old enough to remember, when my mom first got credit cards, and even I did, you know, it's like a man had to be the lead on it. You couldn't just go out and get a credit card. It was Mrs. Jalester Linton, it was daughter of, I mean, I had to carry, you know, it's, it's crazy. And it's like, it, it didn't matter what color you were, you were just denied because you were a woman. And a lot of awakening had to happen. And I can remember my mom fighting for the right to be who she was, you know, when it came to banking, when it came to everything else. And she always used to tell us, she said, always pay yourself first on the side. Don't wait, don't have all your money in with anybody. And even to this day, you know, I mean, Bob and I have many joint accounts, but I also got a few on my own <laughs> because that's, because, you know, not, I mean, we, and we've been married 34 years and I ain't going nowhere, but mm -hmm. it's just the fact that you must learn how to control your own self, which means you also control your own purse. And no matter how you look at it, green is the power 
of America and the world. And the more we realize that the green power doesn't have any other color other than green, and that then we're going to be moving ahead, you know, and hopefully we'll be getting some Harriet Tubman sometime soon. But, you know, it's just, uh, we don't show up on any of the money, but we better have it in order to have power. Because, you know, if you've got health issues, if you don't have money, we got, we were talking about a friend today that's been in the hospital off and on since last year. And he's running out of options because he ain't got no money. Mm. You know, so it's, and that's just one of many examples of why women are gaining and uh, must continue to gain and be supported. Uh, by each other. We spend a lot of time, women spend a lot of time stabbing other women in the back. It's like, I, I, if I don't have what you have, that's okay. I may not want what you have, but it doesn't mean that I can't move forward and get my own. Um, so that's what we've got to do. Just Support each other. And if you, if you can't agree with everybody, that's okay. Because I don't agree with a lot of men either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's okay, but it doesn't mean that I have to put you down to make myself look better. It just doesn't work that way. Okay, Jacques. Okay, okay. I'm gonna get Jacques first. Jacques. Yeah. Uh, I uh, have always paid attention uh, to women uh, because women have always been a very strong force in my life. I've definitely uh, agreed with uh, Jackie and Maggie that uh, the women's suffrage movement uh, says a lot about what a lot of white women have had to go through. Uh, and, and, and you have to feel some sympathy for that. However, they, you know, I, I realize that some of them are privileged and some of them, you know, kind of act like they're men, that they feel like because of them being Caucasian that they have the right to do the things that they do and to, uh, and to put other people down to take advantage of people and what have you. But a lot of them, I, I think, truly understand, and, and, and this is just my personal opinion of, of what Black people go through, uh, to make it in this world. Often when I, I'm on Facebook or anywhere, you know, all, all my life when I, you know, wish someone a happy birthday, I usually say, you know, I wish you to be healthy and wealthy. I wish you prosperity as well as a happy birthday. Because as you said, Maggie, emphatically, I agree that green power is very, very important. Uh, and, and we have to think about money. You know, I, I don't care what your religion is, what your belief is, what your politics are. Uh, you have to think about money. You have to think about finances. Uh, and, 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 you know, having been evicted over the years, and my father used to get us evicted every four or five months, we were evicted on the street. And, you know, and, and, and it's nothing that I'm proud of. Now, myself, I've been a landlord for 36 years. And every now and then I got to evict somebody. And you hate to do that, but a lot of times, you know, uh, it, people, you know, have the money and they just don't think like they should when it comes to money. You know, if your priority is gambling and getting tattoos and taking care of somebody who's not deserving, then, you know, you got a problem. But I agree that, again, that we, we have to pay, that women are very, very important in this world. There's, I wouldn't do without, I, I, you know, without a woman, I, you know, I'm so fortunate I can turn over and we got enough room in the house where my wife get mad at me for five minutes. She can go to another room and we can chill. But, you know, but Maggie, uh, but you know, you know, when you've been together and Hattie can uh, test this as well, you know, when you've been together a long time with a spouse, you know, we're in a very rare uh, category nowadays. You know, when, when, uh, of course, back in the day, everybody got married. Now nobody wants to get married. I'm always trying to encourage it as much as I got to try to tell people. It's not as bad. And, and you know, I, tell, I'm not, and I jokingly say sometimes, you know, we're all grown here, and I'm going to keep this, I'm going to give you the Smokey Robinson version. The loving gets better when you put your name on that marriage certificate. Hey, Annie, look. Oh, I just wanted to throw in a little joke. Um, give an honor also to my grandmother, who I was fortunate enough to be alive to see her to have her drive with a uh, ride with me as I drove a little convertible with the top back and grandmama didn't mind it at all. And when I rolled up to the station, uh, Maggie and John made me think of talking about money. I had the tank filled up and 
uh, during that time, <laughs> excuse me, during that time, uh, we had full service, which you probably don't even know of now, uh, Christopher. <laughs> uh, everything now is self-serve, but then somebody would come out to your car, fill the tank up for you. And when they did that, I pulled out my little credit card and gave the man. So when I finished signing in and everything and pulled off, Grandmama said, oh, isn't that nice? You don't have to pay for all that stuff. All you got to do is show them a little piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that, 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 that is a good one. You know, I, when, I think of, when I'm thinking about money, and we're talking about it, is something that is needed. It's no doubt is but is needed. But we are still in that plantation mentality, man. We, there's never going to be an even playing field. They they promise us a forty acres in a mule. We have yet to get that forty acres in a in a mule. Right today in twenty twenty one, a black man earns half the salary of a white man. So they are making sure that we don't get an opportunity, man. To 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 make a dollar bill, man. You you even got to sell yourself out, or or really make some really fantastic uh, sacrifices to to move up the ladder. Every time we move up the ladder, they cut one rim off and you fall back down. And that's exactly what's happening today. And we got to understand, man. You know, uh, a good example. You know, Pat Ewing went to uh, New York this weekend, <laughs> and Pat Ewing played for the Knicks for 15 years. His name is up in the rafters with his name, every number. Uh, he's in the uh, NBA Hall of Fame. He's seven feet tall. And he walked through the door and they give him the blues to most show credentials. He, he, he said, man, I thought I owned this place. No, brother, you ain't never gonna own them. You got to realize that you're still black and they don't care. Whoever stopped you coming in there, they mad at you because you are who you are. And they don't want you to be who you are. And all Patrick, you and these other brothers got to realize they did it to Charles Oakley. They did it to Spike Lee. He told Spike Lee he couldn't come in. Uh, the, uh, the, the employees entry no more to get to his seats on the floor because he was black. That comes from the top. Dolan, whoever owns Madison Square Garden. That should never be happening. Amanda, uh, what's the girl there? Amanda Goldman. She just got to saying how she was profiled and and all the way to her apartment door. You're a black man. This is still America. It's still white privilege. And we got to make our kids understand that. I think good example is Chris understands that. Chris, you wanna you wanna elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. I'll even jump in another example that uh, along those lines. You remember a couple of years ago um, when the Raptors won the, the championship, Masai Ujiri, the owner of the Raptors, got physically shoved by a police officer for trying to go on the court with his team for winning the championship. The, the only one of the like when you want to talk about the, our own the place, he literally owns a team and a security guard has his first credentials to the point where he shoves him. Where so just to, as you said, to elaborate on that point, it's 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 just the blackness. It doesn't matter how hard you are, you know. They're going they're going to check you. They want to gatekeep you. They want to keep you out. They want to make sure you still feel small, even if you are big time. That's right. Uh, Kevin, you want to say something on that, Kevin? Uh, I just know that uh, it's just a continuing pattern, you know. And until black folks can come together. And um, and see what's going on. You know, sometimes even with within our black nation, we got classism. You know, you'll you'll have black folks that have means that are, you know, they will look at it like it's only the folks that are in the ghetto. Until they get that, uh, like Paul Mooney used to say, excuse my language, that nigga wake up call. You know, mm -hmm. David Patrick Ewing. And he said it, and I know Pastor Ewing, you know, he come from the street. And I know he set that person straight, but he just, he had to express that, like, I'm still coming up in here. They, they do know who he is. 
and 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 uh, it's just a nigga wake up call. They're doing it because they're losing, losing your volume, volume Kevin. Huh? There you go. You, you was losing the volume. Oh, okay. They do it because they can do it. And until black folks come together, they're going to continue to do it. We, we, we have to come together. We got to buy from one another. We got to uh, be friends with one another. Stop being so aggressive to one another. Um, and until that happens, I mean, th these white people are going to exploit it. And that's what they're doing. That, that other thing with that white woman, that white woman, she's a co-conspirator. The white man does it every time. Look, the white man gave the black man the right to vote before he gave his own white woman. Hmm. When Donald Trump came in, they, uh, white women voted for Donald Trump. These women are more savage than the white man. And they support what he does. Even though all the stuff that happens to them and this woman fem feminism thing, you know, Emmett Till, these are white women that love black men innately in their own nature because they, they see what this black man is and they say, oh, he raped me. And then before she dies, she says, oh, uh, I lied. And, and this is this black people have to unite. And I think that's, you know, I was used to say to myself, this is why the most high, this is why the Lord allowed Donald Trump to come in so that white people, black people could get that nigga wake up call again. And, 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 and understand that Donald Trump allowed white people to be who they really are. They have not changed. They have not apologized for slavery. Look, the dude Pierce, whatever his name is, uh, that has that, that talk show. And then they, when they was talking about the, uh, the princess, uh, you know, the one that just had the baby and sat down oh, yeah, with Oprah. Right. And then she sat there and, you know, she was talking about the racism that was, that was, that was in the, uh, uh, you know, of, of course, uh, within the royal family. And when he got checked on live TV, he just got to walk out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so something has that. Black people, you, you, we can't do it by legislation. Black folks got to come together and be brothers and sisters. Until, and until that happens, the white man is going to exploit. He's a warrior by nature. He's a destroyer by his nature. And, uh, and the only reason why we're getting any kind of reprieve right now is because it's messing with the money. Yeah. But it's going to yeah. keep happening, you know, over and over. And I, I try my best to be polite to young black men and older black men because I know we're all under stress. But we got to stop being each other's enemies and got to understand that we got an enemy. We are under attack in this country uh, the police department, you can Google it when, when they own the thing and they say number one black male, that's all across the country. Every police department use that code number one male. Number one male means black man. And this is this is this is just what's in stone in this country. You know, people, you know, you say, oh, um, the people who founded the country was racist. They were slave owners. This country has a birth defect that she still lives with, and she and she's happy with it. The first person in on the stock market, a slave, a body. The first uh, when they when they first invented insurance companies, slave ships. They insured slave ships. This country is a thousand percent wicked, and you can't do it by just just you. you we have to unite. Black folks got to unite. We got all these different leaders, all these different little sections, um, you know, and, and it's going to take another 200 years in order for this stuff to grow up, you know, in order for these, these, we only, things only happen now is when white people get tired of, it. you know, when white people get tired of saying, hey, y'all just keep killing these black men. I'm tired of it. When white people get tired of it, it's a problem. But black folks, we just absorb and absorb and absorb. So anyway, I know I went on a rant, but I'm kind of passionate That's about good. it. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Charlie, how would you close this segment out so we can take it somewhere else? Charlie, go here. Oh, I just want to, um, I voice the sentiments of what's being said, but I also think that as women, black women, we have to step up and speak more and speak louder because we take a lot of things that's been poured on us or dished out. I agree with all of what the men and ladies were saying, but I think 
we have to be a little bit more aggressive. I know a lot of women are soft and being hurt. May I give one example? Go ahead. I live in a neighborhood, and, and I'll just say, uh, for Savannah, it's rather affluent neighborhood. Very few Blacks live out here. And we have a grocery store, and one of my friends went in and bought a large steak. I forgot, and I don't know meat so well, but anyway, it was a large steak, but she wanted it chopped uh, or sliced. And the white lady behind the meat counter uh, did that, but then she said to my friend, um, when my friend asked, what time can I come back and pick it up from the, the butcher? And she said, um, what time does she want you to serve it? <laughs> and this is a lady that lives out here and you know she pays for her home and everything, but that was the attitude. She wow. just uh, she just assumed that she was working yeah. in in a home with the whites. So I think she dressed her off pretty well after she laughed about it. She wasn't rude, but she told her that her clients all aren't, you know, that it's a learning thing. Sometimes we have to make them aware. They've grown up with this privilege. Right that some of them, I'm not excusing them with their so-called innocence, but, but we, we have to speak up to that kind of insult. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, Gary, I want to uh, switch, uh, switch gears here. Uh, we lost uh, a, great, um, a great athlete uh, just uh, past uh, 24 hours, 48 hours in Marvin Hagler. Um, let me say this. Um, this guy is definitely one of, the, one of the greatest fighters of all time. Not only was he a great fighter, but he was a great human being. A guy didn't really care about the spot, spotlight. He was a gentleman. He was a class act. You know, He was a guy that walked away from the game and said the hell with it when he saw that what was going on wasn't right. You know, He thought he didn't lose a fight, that they just took the fight from him. He said, enough is enough. And he died at the age of 66. And uh, what I want to do now, I want to, I want to show you the greatest they considered the greatest three rounds ever in the history of boxing. And I want Gary uh, to run that video. Then I'm gonna come back with Jock, and Jock will do a little commentary on uh, what he knew about uh, Marvin Hagler. Okay. <laughs> Street fight. Right, turns right. He wants it to be a street fight. Listen, Marvin Hagler has been rough inside. He's thrown some low blows. He has thrown Can't see it, Gary. But you know what? Now the right. Can't see it? Can't see it. Can you hear it? I can hear yeah. it. Whoa. Whoa. I don't know if it's the photo blocking it or what, but it's not up. All right, let me see here. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it now. This is the considered the greatest three rounds in boxing history. We just go see a round. All right, thanks, Gary. 
Um, Marvin had to, I mean, that was, if you had to see it from the first round, that third round is indicative of what happened in the first and second round. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity uh, to see uh, Marvin, see Sugar Ray Leonard, see, see Tommy Hearns, the great fighters of that era. And uh, I want to bring in Jacques and tell us about, uh, you know, and uh, Marvin Hagler, Jacques. Yes, that was a picture that Harold showed uh, me back when I was in my, uh, just before I turned 30 in 1987, with me, Marvin, and Ray, that was at his restaurant on the Bethesda. But very quickly, I, I typed up what I wanted to say. Marvin Hagler was born in Newark, New Jersey, married twice with five children by his first wife, Bertha. He was known for his prowess in the ring with the likes of Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, and Roberta Duran. They all became known as the four kings of boxing, undisputed in their weight classes making commercials, dazzling crowds, and Hollywood during his illustrious career in and out the ring. Marvelous quit boxing, moved to Italy in 1988, became an actor and sportscaster. He had 62 career wins commencing in 1973 with 52 by knockout before retiring when Sugar Ray Leonard refused to give him a rematch in 1987. After that April 6, 1986, 87 fight, one of Hagler's managers said to the press, one of those judges should be put in jail for giving the fight to Leonard, and the public largely agreed. Marvin always said he is a sports person and not a politician like Ray Leonard, whom enabled judges to throw a fight for him. The greatest fight ever was between Thomas Hearn and Marvin Hagler, which we just saw in 1985 for boxing history professionals. When I met Marvin at Sugar Ray's restaurant in Bethesda in 1987, and they co Ray co-owned with Glenn Burnt Brenner, the former uh, sportscaster from Channel 9 and his attorney, uh, just before the history-making uh, fight. Marvin, you know, told a few jokes there that evening. He was very gracious taking photographs with my wife and I. Marvin earned over $40 million, which is probably like $100 million or, or better today, in boxing and will be remembered as one of the greatest to wear boxing gloves by boxing fans and his comrades in the sport of boxing all agree. Right. Thank I you. That, I hope I did my two minutes or less. Earl. Yeah. All right. That's great. I just want to <clears throat> remind people that that um, Marvin Hagler lost that fight. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what the real deal is. He, Ray Leonard outsmarted um, Marvin Hagler. He didn't beat him. He outsmarted him. He didn't want to get into what Tommy Hearns got into, so he did. He did a whole different strategy. And what we got to realize: how did Ray Leonard uh, come up with the decision, with a split decision to win? Because Ray Leonard was the cash cow for boxing. It was business. That's the bottom line. It was business. Ray Ray did not beat. Um, Marvin Hagler, and there's no doubt about it. Sugar Ray Leonard is a great boxer, but he was the cash cow in the right place at the right time. Sugar Ray Leonard became the first professional boxer to earn over a hundred million dollars. And I remember when he did have two cents, so that is big time. So hats off and rest in peace, Marvin Hagler. I mean, you'll be you, you'll be missed, man, because you were a class act and <clears throat> and the gentleman. Anybody got any comment before we head out of here? Well, I'll tell you, Harold, I was at that fight pay-per-view live <laughs> at the Capitol Center Arena. And because Ray was a local guy, I wanted Ray to win, you know? And so yeah. I was pulling for him. He came out of retirement and uh, I saw it. The, the split decision went to Ray. I was happy. And then a week later, when I watched that fight, because I'm kind of considering myself a boxing aficionado, when it came on like a week later and I watched the fight, I was like, man, Ray didn't win this fight. No, no, no. I got all caught up in the fury. I looked at it. Ray, oh, Marvin put it on him. So. Hey, Gary. If I can jump in right quick, uh, my name is uh, Jacques Chevalier. I have a brother named Kenny Chevalier, who's a boxing referee, mm -hmm. and he's done uh, some of the biggest fights in boxing history. One of the last fights he did was, uh, uh, well, one of his big fights that he did when the MGM first opened up, he did those first two telecasts with HBO and Showtime. He actually, my brother, Kenny, refereed the fight where the boxer died. I'm sure you recall that. Uh, you remember the guy from Russia that died, the boxer, the very... Yeah. Evening, he went to the hospital and died. My brother uh, refereed that fight. 
So my brother will probably disagree with what you said about Ray, because him and Ray go way back. <laughs> but, you know, Harold, I still love you, my man. But I kind of think Hagler might have had the edge that evening, man. Ain't but no I love problem. Ray. Don't get me wrong. Wait. Whatever way you want to take it, I'm just I'm just telling you what the real deal is. Okay. <laughs> Nobody knows me better, know me better, know Ray better than I do. That's right. I get, I go with that. I'm Ray gonna put my fighter. mic on mute. Great heart. So congratulations, congratulations. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Jackie. And Christopher disappeared. And of course, uh, thank you, Gary. And thank Hattie T uh, for being on this uh, this special show, uh, Women's History. Oh, okay, Christopher, you got 30 seconds. You got the last word. <laughs> I got the last word. I mean, um, thanks to my dad, I grew up as also a boxing aficionado, so I've seen all the classic fights and rounds. And, yeah, that, that was just some spectacular, spectacular, spectacular boxing. And I love it. <laughs> and rest in peace to Hagler, one of the just greatest punchers and fighters that we, we've seen in the game, like I said, and, Inspired, like I said, my friend is a boxer, um, Swift Jared Hurt, and he's he's a fan, and you know, and we, you know, he's inspired by the greats, and it's because of generations like my dad and, and people like Mr. Bell that that we get to see the legacy of the of the great fighters that laid the groundwork for you know the current fighters that are out today. All right, hey gang, that's going to, going to be it for uh, Zoom Sunday. Speak the truth, but I think we spoke the truth here today. Uh, until next time, I just want you to remember that every black face you see is not your brother and every white face is not your enemy. Uh, see you next time. Have a great day. Be safe, everybody. Wear your mask. <laughs> Hi, I'm Harold Bell. My wife Hattie and I found the nonprofit organization in 1968, shortly after the riots that almost destroyed my hometown, Washington, D.C. The program caters to the needs of at risk children as it relates to social services such as education, law enforcement, drug abuse, gang related violence, and other anti social behavior. 